Um, so I am going to start the meeting. My name is John Kelsey. This is the uh, Wood Turners uh, Hybrid Meeting Open Forum. Um, we have a couple of amusements prepared for you tonight, but not very many because last couple of times we over prepared and we left people sitting on the screen with their hands up. So we don't want to do that tonight. We're going to call on all of you or anyone who wants to speak or share your situation. Um, as a preliminary, though, I, I would invite you all, if you're not already on a gallery view, to look at a gallery view so you can see all the other people who are on the call. Uh, and I'd also uh, like anyone who doesn't know how to use share screen, uh, or rather how to use the raise hand to uh, learn raise hand. I suspect you all know, but that's the way to get attention and get your turn to speak out in this forum. If you hold your hand up under current Zoom, it will see it and raise a hand. You got to do it just right, but it will do it. But other than that, if it doesn't do it, on the reactions tab, which is in the bottom of your screen toward the right in the row of icons, if you click that, the big button is raise hand. And when you do that, a little hand pops up like mine just did. And I go to the, and the, the raise hands go up to the top corner of the screen and you show up in a nice row so we can know who wants to speak. So if anyone would like to try raise hand who doesn't know raise hand, now's a good moment to do that. You're telling me you already know how to do it, all of you all? Okay, there comes some. Good. Thank you. Appreciate the tries. Uh, let's see. Tonight, um, I have a little slideshow and video I'd like to show, but I'm gonna. I'd like to hold on to that for a little bit rather than uh, holding the floor uh, from the beginning. Um, I would say that we have posted this week a number of videos to the uh, Ch AAW Chapter Leadership Library. We posted. A, I posted a video on. The just using a camcorder and a big TV and another video on the very basic single camera all zoom setup. Those are both oh, 13, 15 minute videos on YouTube. They're available through that AAW library. They're also available through my own channel. Uh, and they're part of a library of stuff we're trying to build uh, to give clubs a set of resources to approach this hybrid meeting business. Uh, some of you are very sophisticated with complicated setups, but I often talk to club leaders who come onto this who don't have a, have a clue. They've been thrown into it. They don't know what to do. And so we want to give them the tools to get their feet down and uh, get this figured out for their clubs because the uh, hybrid meeting is such a terrific member benefit. Um, Okay, so let, having let you know all that and invited you to watch the videos, um, I'm going to turn to Harvey Rogers. Harvey's been a regular attendee here and is from Cascade Woodturners. Um, and he's asked such great questions. I asked him if he would prepare a presentation about uh, their club. Um, and I'm going to go to Harvey to, to do that now. Is that okay with you, Harvey? That's fine. It'll teach me to ask questions. All right. Well, your spotlight's on you. So, all right. Uh, so, I'm, I'm Harvey Rogers. I'm with the Cascade Wood Turners in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we have about 97 members. Uh, our president is on tonight, Suzanne Jensen. Uh, and uh, I'll just get started. I have a PowerPoint-like thing to try and present. See if it works. You're on. I'm on and then I have to find the play button. All right, so this just repeats uh, Cascade Wood Turners. Uh, I call this our hybrid meeting efforts because as you will discover, we're doing hybrid meetings, but we're not doing them perfectly. Um, I thought I'd begin with what we had before the pandemic lockdown. Um, we had two movie cameras, a wireless microphone system, powered PA speakers, an HDMI switch, a digital projector, a screen, and oodles of cables. We met in a, in a portion of a great big industrial space. Uh, we used my personal Mac laptop to connect the HDMI switch to the projector. Uh, and it worked, uh, but because of the ambient lighting, the screen was often very dim. Uh, when the pandemic lockdowns began, we stopped meeting, duh. And shortly after that, we lost our meeting space. We moved all of our gear into storage space, volunteered by some of our wonderful members. And then several months after the lockdown started, we began doing club meetings entirely by Zoom. 
Uh, there are there are really three people I need to give a shout out to uh, here. One was our then president Gary Borders, who's um, a tech guy. And he worked very hard to get the club in shape to do Zoom meetings. He formed a gang of three, includes me, uh, Stephen Walgrave, Gary, and then uh, coming along a little bit later, but as wonderful moral support and figuring out things that don't otherwise work, our president, Suzanne Jensen, who I think is attending the meeting today. Um, when we decided to... Um, try and cope with Zoom. We got a basic Zoom Pro account, and we only showed IRDs that were presented by professional demonstrators. Members could only watch on their own computers, tablets, or phones. We didn't have any go to a place and see it. And members who wanted to speak to the demonstrators of the group of participants could unmute and just do that. That had virtually no technical problems except teaching our members how to use Zoom. Um, about the time we found a new place, which is a bit over a year ago, um, we decided to get set up to do hybrid meetings. We got a lot of advice from Alan Zenreich's videos and the info on lucidwoodturners.com. And we bought an ATEM Mini Pro a pair of Rode wireless go-to mics, two 55-inch LED TVs, a Windows laptop, and a bunch more cables. And to our dismay, we discovered that this was not plug-and-play equipment. So um, we began meeting in Gary's basement with the equipment to try and figure out how to plug this stuff together. Um, when we finally got something that was working, our secretary and gang of three members, Stephen Walgrave, Walgrave, diagrammed it, refined it, and improved it. And that process is actually still ongoing. We discovered we could easily show an IRD that a demonstrator was presenting in Zoom to people who attended in person. So you could watch it at home on Zoom, or you could come to the meeting and you could watch it on our TVs. All we had to do is connect the laptop to the internet. We're in a facility now where we can connect with a very long ethernet cable. We um, run the HDMI and we use the laptop to connect to the Zoom session. Uh, run the HDMI cable out from the laptop to one of the TVs, run an audio line out to our powered PA system, fire up Zoom and join the presenter's Zoom presentation. That worked great. People staying at home could hear and watch the IRD at home on Zoom. People attending the meeting in person could see the Zoom presentation on the TV and hear the Zoom presentation through the PA system. Everybody could see and hear the IRD just fine, but, but people in the room couldn't talk to the Zoom presenter even though people participating on Zoom could. So people participating on Zoom, it was just like we didn't have an in-person meeting. They could talk to the presenter, they could talk to other people on Zoom, but we were basically, if you were in the room, we were muted. So um, that wasn't satisfactory and we tried putting a microphone in the room and that didn't work at all. Uh, Couple of reasons for that. Uh, there's a very significant delay or latency between the sound in the room, which is almost immediate, and the sound coming through Zoom. So if you manage to get go both going at once, it would sound like gibberish. Um, I think our delay in our situation when it's over a second, which is enough to really mess things up. But probably more importantly, Zoom suppresses the sound from the room that's being shown on Zoom. Uh, and you all have um, noticed that when you've participated in Zoom, if you unmute and speak into Zoom, your voice doesn't feed back to you through Zoom. If it did, it'd keep feeding back and we'd have very loud sounds. 
So it's a, it's a nice feature of Zoom, but it messes things up when we were trying to get sound to the Zoom session from our meeting. So we tried to figure out how to fix that. And here's what we came up with. We decided to use our wireless mics to let people attending the meeting in person talk to the demonstrator and the other people on Zoom. Now, using those mics doesn't mean just planting them in a room. This is handing a mic to a person, having them talk. That worked fine, but it revealed another problem. We meet in this large room. It's actually a small school gym. And people talking in the room cannot easily be heard by other people in the room unless their voices are amplified. When we just sent the output from the mics to Zoom, the people in the Zoom meeting could not hear what the people were saying into our mics unless those people yelled. In other words, this setup did not amplify the sound from our microphones in the meeting room. But the people attending by Zoom could hear the sound from our mics just fine. Sorry, dog. <laughs> to let the people in the room hear what was being said into our mics, we needed to amplify the sound coming out of our mics in the meeting room. Otherwise, people in the room couldn't easily hear what people in the room were saying into the mics in the room, but people on the on Zoom could hear them just fine. That's kind of a silly circumstance, but it was quite true. Well, let so me, we let me stop you right here to say that sure. this is a very common situation. What you're describing is uh, uh, many clubs have experienced this very same thing. That is comforting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so what we did to address that is we um, took the the wire leading from our microphone receiver. And we put it on a splitter. We sent one wire to Zoom, in our case, through our ATEM Mini. But it, you could send it to the computer if that's what were you, you were using to uh, combine the signals for Zoom. And we sent the other line to our PA system. We used ordinary audio cables and a simple Y connector. Um, we now use the PA system to amplify the sound from our microphones for the benefit of the people attending the meeting in person. Then we discovered, of course, that um, we weren't amplifying the Zoom sound for the people in the rooms. So we ended up buying a sound bar, hooking it up to the t one of the TVs, and used that to amplify the sound coming from the Zoom presentation so people in the room could hear it. Uh, one soundbar so far seems to be loud enough that it works just fine. Uh, in the process of doing all this, we discovered another uh, problem we hadn't imagined would exist. The background for that is when we were doing Zoom meetings, I would present our show and tell stuff. Um, I would collect photographs of members' work, put it into a PowerPoint, and screen share that. Um, during the Zoom meeting. <clears throat> so our first time trying to do a hybrid meeting, I took my laptop, moved to the very back of the room because I was simply trying to get rid of unwanted noise, fired it up, and I could present the image portions just fine by screen sharing. But as soon as I took myself off mute, the sound from the room fed back into my laptop fed back into Zoom, and we had this rum thing. So that didn't work at all. Uh, so as to deal with that, we now do not have anyone connect to Zoom in the room where the presentation is unless they're muted. And I think I'm the only one that would do that. So I don't do that anymore. Here's a diagram of what our current setup looks like. Again, thanks to Stephen Walgrave, who did the diagram with very nice images. We have um, we have the microphone over. Let's see. I don't have a cursor. So upper left hand corner, we have the microphones. They lead out to the PA system. Lower left. Um, the ATEM Mini 
in the middle. The ATM Mini also collects the input from our cameras. Um, we use a separate monitor for the ATEM Mini, sits on the table with the ATEM Mini and lets the person managing that see what's going on with the ATEM. Um, we connect the ATEM using its USB out to the computer, to the laptop USB input. Um, we send the video of the Zoom session out from the laptop to our TVs. If we have two using two TVs, we use an HDMI splitter. And then we connect, as I mentioned, one of the TVs to a sound bar to amplify the sound in the Zoom session for the benefit of the people in the room. I'll, I'll pause here in case anybody has questions about this. Yeah, I have some if others, others don't. Um, is that a powered HDMI splitter? Um, it is a powered HDMI splitter. And with that HDMI out, um, HDMI out to the monitor from the uh, ATEM, what, what is the signal you're getting? The, the, the same signal that's going out on the, to the world or an ATEM uh, management uh, signal? The latter. It's um, AT, ATEM comes with software. This thing shows, um, it looks like, the pictures you see of fancy TV um, control rooms. You have the screen from the first camera, the screen from the second camera, bunch of other stuff. You, you have the screen that's going out to Zoom. You can combine and all that stuff. It's really cool looking. Do we currently take full advantage of it? I think not. That, that, that's the HD, that's the ATEM multi-view is, is what it's called. Oh, thank you. Is that Steve Cosenzi down there? Yes, it is. Yeah, do you want to say any more about that? I was going to ask you to talk about that tonight anyhow. Uh, we could, uh, if you want, I can, I mean, it, it, I can get into that, but it, it's the multi-view, which gives you, if you're managing picture in a picture or any of that other stuff, plus it gives you your audio outputs on the screen as well. Very, very useful tool. But I can, it's up to you, John. I can, I can talk about it later if you want. Yeah, let's, let's have Harvey uh, complete his presentation. And we'll come back to you. Could, okay. could I ask one question first? Yes. Har Harvey, are you still using the uh, wire, the Rode wireless go-to system? Yes. Okay, where, where would that fit in your diagram? Okay, so this, this diagram, the, this shows an old style hardwired mic. The, the Rode go-to wireless is actually a set of little plastic squares. There's two of them that are microphones, and a third one is the wireless receiver that gets the wireless signal from the, um, from the two wireless microphones. And then we connect the receiver um, hardwired to a splitter and send one line of it to the ATEM Winnie Mini and the other line of it to the PA speaker. With the with the road receiver, you should have uh, two outputs on the back of your receiver. I mean, one one can go to the ATEM and one can go to the speaker. I'm I'm not sure why you would put a splitter in there. But who's who's asking that? So I can find your picture, please. This is Steve Malat. Okay, Steve, I'll find you. Well, I I this won't be the first time tonight, but I'm happy to plead ignorance on that and just say we didn't think of it. Steve, you want to talk a little, explain a little better what you're what you're talking to? I think this is to the heart of a, the kinds of problems that a lot of people are having. Well, on, on the back of the uh, Rode wireless go-to receiver, there are two audio outputs, and one of the audio outputs can either go into your. Uh, well, a lot of people feed it into the ATEM, and the other. Uh, audio output can, can feed into, uh, normally, uh, you need something to combine it with your audio from the, uh, from the, from the zoom. And if it's, if you, you feed both of them into a mixer and then you run the mixer to the speaker, but, but you shouldn't, you should not need a splitter coming out of the, uh, uh, road receiver because there were already two outputs, uh, in the back of that receiver. So just from my own information, 
using the splitter, do we get a loss of signal strength or anything? The splitter is like a $3 device. Well, and I think anytime you add something in the line, there's always the potential for latency or there's always the pet potential for a signal uh, degrade degradation. And if you've already got a splitter built into the uh, road receiver, there's really no reason to put another splitter in the line. Great. Well, thank you for that. Well, on the, and now I have a ceremonic system that's similar to the, to the road. Uh, and I also have a Movo system and they have uh, the jacks are labeled uh, headphone and line. Are they the same? No. No, John, that, that, that this above, above my pay grade, but basically when you go into an amplifier, the amplifier has an assumed signal strength. And one of those two gives that. And the other is going into a set of headphones, which is a, uh, a lower signal strength going into those headphones. Does that so, make sense? Yeah, so line is a, is a stronger signal than headphone out on these which, devices. Yeah, and it's no, on the road, it's also adjustable. So, now, Steve, which, uh, which terminals are we talking about now? Or is, are we talking about the same outputs off that device? Uh, all I know is there are two outputs and one you can run right into uh, the powered speaker and the other one you can run right into the ATEM or you can run it into a mixer. Nor normally, if you run it, the problem with running it into an ATEM is uh, in, in, in the diagram here, you've got in-room system coming through two separate speakers. You've got the Zoom uh, audio coming through your sound bar and you've got the in-room audio coming through the uh, speaker in the bottom left corner. And, and that's not a major problem if you don't mind having two separate speakers. If you want to consolidate all, all of the audio into one speaker, you, you can't run the in-room uh, audio into the ATEM. You have to run it into a mixer because you've got to mix it with the audio from Zoom. And you get the audio from Zoom from the laptop. Uh, so you combine those two in a mixer, and then you run the output from the mixer into uh, your single speaker. You know, I, I'm thinking, do you know enough about this to prepare a slideshow for us that will try and teach us this for another session? Because I think this is where a lot of people are having a lot of trouble. Well, and, and everything I know, I learned from Alan Zenreich. So, I mean, that's <laughs> this. Okay. I, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not a tech guru until... Two years ago, I couldn't even hook a uh, laptop up to a TV with an HDMI cable. So, well, me neither. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Harvey, I'd like to, to ask you a different kind of question, not as technical sure. as what Steve was talking on. Uh, as a demonstrator, if I'm providing an IRD to your club, what do I see? What do you see? Well, yes, I. I if this is not an answer to your question, uh, re-ask it. We, we start our meeting with the hybrid meetings. We start our meeting with our camera on and focused on our president who opens the meeting and makes an announcement. Um, we do the slideshow thing that I talked about and um, we also show people, people bring work to the meeting and we have them talk about that. So all of that's coming through the camera and the Zoom presenter sees that. Um, then when we, it's time for the Zoom presenter to go, we, it, th those come in, in two different flavors. Most of our recent ones have been pre-recorded um, IRDs where the, the presenter narrates them. So um, somebody will run that on screen share, but if it's actually a live- Someone in your, someone in your club will run, run the screen share in the video, not the um, demonstrator. No, actually the, it's usually the demonstrator who has that video. Okay. So, so we make that demonstrator a co-host. If some of the demonstrators like to be host and then we we're co-hosts, um, sometimes we're the host and we make the demonstrator a co-host. And then in any event, the demonstrator will share their video and talk. 
Uh, if it's as uh, he's doing that, can the can the demonstrator see the audience? That's that's the key question that, that I oh, have. If if we were to point our camera, said, I'm sorry, you said if you don't do that as a matter of course. Yes. Well, the the other thing about us um, that this question will reveal is that we are desperately lucky to get this thing working by the time the meeting is supposed to start. Uh, an honest man, John, an honest man. <laughs> so we keep thinking afterwards, we should turn the camera on the audience, but, but we're, <laughs> we haven't done that yet. I always begin with it. I try, I'm, I'm trying to develop the habit of uh, putting the camera on the audience and showing that to the Zoom and asking the Zoom to go on uh, uh, gallery view so they can see all the gallerists, uh, the Zoomists, as well as the people in the room. And I use, uh, in the meeting room, I use the only, single monitor so I can show the gallery view to the meeting room. So hmm. people in the room can see the people on the Zoom and the people on the Zoom. You know, I want everybody to see everybody. Because when I come home from a meeting, the first thing my wife asks me is, well, who was there? Who'd you talk to? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so. Nice. Go forward, Steve. You're on. This is this is a great presentation. So you want me to continue? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, great. Unless there's more. So, can I can I jump in here a second and straighten something out? The yeah, let's get more questions and see what we get there. If there's more questions first. Yeah. Um, as far as those outputs from the um, wireless microphone receiver, um, a um, uh, Headphone output is a higher uh, higher level output than the line than the line level output, um, and uh, you'll notice when you plug something into your computer, it asks you what you're plugging in, and that way it can regulate itself. But you don't have that from your um, uh, from the the receiver. So uh, there are two de definitely different signals, and depending on what you plug them into, whether you can control it or not. Um, the ATEM is pretty good at dealing with both of them. Um, some um, amplified speakers aren't so good at it. So you might want to switch them if you're having a problem. So just, just to put that out there. You're not going to damage anything by trying it one way and trying it the other way though, are you? No, you won't damage anything because most of these things have built-in protections. It might be way distorted. Um, if your sound is distorted, then you're over you have the wrong, you have the, um, one, yeah. the headphone output plugged into a line level source and it's just too high. Got it. Okay. Back to you, Steve. Unless there's more questions, let me just uh, remove the spotlight on Rick and uh, get a quick gallery view here and see if there's more questions. Cause this was a good, uh, good interjection. Any more questions? Ken, Ken's got one. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah. Hi. Great. First off, this is a great presentation so far, but I just need a clarification. Uh, there are only two microphones that you're using in the room. There's nothing on camera one or there's no, no audio on camera two. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I mean, the signals are in the HDMI cord from the cameras, but we don't, we mute them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Anybody else in the gallery view, which I'm looking at here with a, with a question for Harvey? or a comment, and then I'm going to let Harvey continue. Go ahead, Harvey. All right. So that's this diagram. Uh, the next thing is um, kind of a summary and stuff we know we need to work on. Um, the meetings, of the hybrid meetings we've had, there's been like four, I think, and there's another one this week. Um, they worked, but they've had glitches. Um, we hope that the number of glitches is diminishing, but this complex system seems to have the ability to create glitches we haven't anticipated. So I imagine we'll be dealing with, with some more in the future. Um, the things we know we need to work on, we need more time to set up and test before the meeting starts. Um, our, we're in a, a former school facility that's now a child, um, like a care daycare facility for children and staff is around till 530 and our meetings have been starting at 630 and we can't get into the room or use it uh, until 530 and we've opened up the zoom channel at six 
um, which gives us a half an hour to get basic Zoom operating and another half an hour to get everything uh, working. And that's just not really enough time to do it in a semi-professional fashion. And we have three, three Techphilic people who um, help with all this and have, have helped put it together. But two meetings now, one of them has been rude enough to go on vacation. So it's just been two of us. And it's clearly an hour is not enough time for us to drag everything out of storage, try and figure out where the wires go and get things started. So we've delayed this next meeting this week. We've delayed the meeting a half an hour, give us more time. Um, and uh, next thing we're hoping to do is recruit some more people who are tech comfortable and have practiced using our system. So if somebody's sick or uh, somebody's out of town, someone else can fill in um, and things will still work. Uh, there are a couple of questions up. Uh, I think those are a raised hands for people who want to speak themselves. I'm, I'm looking at a full gallery here. Uh, Gretchen, are you uh, with a question or are you wanting to talk to something else? Uh it's actually a comment on this slide here, which you haven't quite gotten to that point yet, but needing to arrange a Zoom participant monitor to monitor the Zoom presentation. I wanted to share what our club does. I, I'm with the uh, Tennessee Association of Woodturners in, in Nashville. We've been running hybrid meetings uh, really since the very beginning and have a setup pretty similar to what you've done, Harvey, except the, we did just upgrade to putting in, a, in an audio mixer too to resolve a lot of the audio problems hmm. that as we we're discussing. So we, we now have both a video mixer and an audio mixer. But uh, one of the things we have done to address the Zoom presentation screwing up is um, I, I run all the Zoom meetings for us. And uh, I tend to have two laptops there, one that is actually presenting to the Zoom call and another one that I have actually set up as a monitor. And then that one as a monitor, as you said, has to be muted. So I just have a, a headset with microphone on it. And huh. that's well, because that way I can sit in the room and I can see physically what's going on in the room as well as what's going through the Zoom call, which in our case, we are not doing, I, we, are, we are presenting in the room. So we're typically having a live demonstrator in the room that we are then presenting to our remote audience as well. So it's very important for me to be able to monitor the Zoom call so that I can mute people who, who log in and unmute themselves. So um, what, like I said, what we've done is just have a, a separate computer there, log in as a second Zoom client, the, basically the, the Zoom monitor, and simply use a headphone on it. And that's worked really well. It, it takes a little bit of getting used to because of the latency of what's coming through the headphone, but uh, mm. it does tend to work very well. I do something a lot like that uh, with an open shocks headphone that is a bone conduction so I can hear through my ears and I can hear through my bones. And, and then when I don't want to hear through the open shocks, I just slip it down and I'm still in the meeting room. So that's for doing the very same thing as, as exactly the same about doing. Yeah. Uh, Harvey, well, since we're in this, how many members do you, does your club have and how many typically come to come to a meeting and how many might be on the zoom call? So we have, um, currently 97 paying members. Um, the attendance has fluctuated and it's only a sample of four, so it's, it's hard to tell. But we've tended to have about twice as many Zoom participants as people attending the meeting itself. That's been our experience as well. Uh, and to the other comment uh, of Gretchen's, I, I got, wanted to mention and forgot that one of the things we learned from other clubs here is to have a co-host who's off-site to do exactly that. Uh, Jim Bowman is doing that for us tonight. Um, he'll mute anybody whose radio comes on. And if the call goes haywire, he's, a, he's a two states away from me or a state and a half away. Um, I'll get a chat from him or a phone call from him and I can respond to it. If he can't do it, deal with it himself uh, from co-host. I think the off-site co-host is pretty important. Uh, the other reason for it is our regular uh, moderator is Bruce Lamb for this meeting. Well, Bruce is unavailable tonight because his internet is down. Well, if, if the internet goes down to a northeast or mid-Atlantic thunderstorm in the middle of your meeting, if you don't have a co-host, the call will bounce to some random member. If you do have a co-host, the call will go to the rent to the co-host will become the host. Yeah, no, that's a perfect segue into my next bullet point, um, which is the need to arrange for 
an offsite monitor. We actually, um, I think someone in this forum suggested we do that and we did it. And then um, the, um, as I say, we're not, our team is not fully trained and the person operating the computer probably put their elbow on the keyboard or something. Anyway, we stopped transmitting the Zoom signal out to Zoom, uh, but we had no clue uh, in the room. We could still see it on the TVs. And so we were happily going along, but our outside monitor called me and said, just want you to know you don't have a signal. So we were able to stop and, and figure out what went wrong and set it right. And that's very important. And we're going to be doing it in the future. Um, Rick, did you have a question? Your hand's up. You're muted. Working. Um, if uh, a suggestion for you in, get, in speeding up your setup is mm -hmm. um, color code your wires. Uh, get a get a bunch of colored tape and color code each end of the wire and put the same code on the device where that end goes in and you'll be able to hook it up much faster because you're just doing color to color you don't have to even think about it and um, you'll get it up in no time flat so the only thing you need to deal with is the internet because all your equipment in the room will be connected correctly and it will just be the internet, which if, if if everything's right, which it should be, you should be able to get right on with no problem. Yeah, I'm gonna- I look forward to that. to that day, man. <laughs> well, it's it's doable. I'm gonna to talk to the color-coded wires in my own presentation later on, but I found a source of some colored plastic tabs that really work well. And the key is to designate the computer a color and the ATEM another color, and then you know, then, then the wires follow the units you, you color the units first and color the wires to suit uh but anyway that's a that's another point for another yeah. another chat i've got a question for harvey about the tv uh, sure. your setup is almost identical to what we have to do except we're in a church we have uh, uh we can't get access to the room till 5 30 we mm. start at seven we have to move the the stuff from a storage room into that uh, room. And um, I'm scared to death of putting a TV on any commercial stand that I've seen so far. I'm working up something. We have a couple of equipment uh, storage cabinets, one of which I'm looking at just adding a couple of two by two steel, the column wall studs for that matter, and putting a, a wall mount on it to put a TV on it. So it'd be very secure. Those cabinets have four inch casters and you couldn't tip them over if you tried. Um, but what are you doing for the TVs, like to move them from your storage area into the room? We don't want to lift stuff, we're all old. We've put everything on casters that we can now, so we don't have to lift. Yeah, so we're, we're using, um, I didn't purchase them, our past president did, but they're um, commercial stands. We have 55 inch LED TVs. And these stands are, I think, rated to hold 75 inch TVs. So th their theoretical capacity is bigger than we use. They have reasonably large casters on them. And we're very fortunate because the room we meet in is dead level with our storage area and we have locking storage. So there's a, a, sill, a door sill, a couple of door sills that we need to push across. So it takes a couple of people to keep from banging the thing really hard, but you lift it a little bit and it goes in and then we put it in the locked storage container. So that's what we're doing. Okay. And Chef Scotty's hand up. Do you want to do that now, John, or? Sure, let's get the questions and uh, then we'll have you, who, who else is ready? Uh, Jeff Fleischer, are you asking a question here? Uh, yes, um, I'm in uh, Virginia, Shenandoah Valley in uh, Virginia, somewhat similar system. Uh, I have a question, do you, if you uh, record your, your presentations or not, uh, we have uh, a paid Zoom license and 
we, we try to record to the cloud via Zoom. It doesn't get the quality that I would like. Uh, we have an ATM Mini Pro and the USB port goes to our laptop. So I can't record off the USB port off the Mini Pro. So I'm just curious how, if and how you get a high quality uh, recording. So, um, so I see that Alan Zenrack is here and I'm now hesitant to respond to the notion of high quality recording because anything I would think is high quality, Alan most certainly will not. Uh, but we just use the standard Zoom recording. Um, I think it records to the cloud um, and then we pull it down, edit it, and then post it on an unpublished YouTube channel and put the link in our website to that channel. The quality is not great, but uh, if the purpose is to let members see what they missed, it does that. And I record to the local computer rather than to the cloud because that's just what I started doing. And, I, and Zoom has improved its cloud recording since we began. But the recording I get on my local computer, again, it's Zoom quality. It's not any better than that. And I've done careful comparisons. I'm working on a Mac, so I can record what the Mac sees with uh, Shift, uh, Shift, Shift Command 5. I can make a separate recording of the whole screen. Um, mm, okay. I've, I've done that. It turns into a 15 gigabyte file, but it does not get me any better resolution than I was getting off the Zoom call. Can, can I chime in here a little bit? Who's that, Alan? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, trying to go, I'm gonna try and find you and get you get a spotlight on you. <clears throat> All right, go for it. All right, so <clears throat> the, the issue, the primary issue that, uh, that people are facing is that since the pandemic began in a Zoom Pro account, the regular paid account, there has been no high definition in group meetings since the pandemic began. It used to be that if you had a pro account, you could have um, either one-on-one -on -one or group meetings. And a group meeting is any meeting where a third participant has joined. Doesn't matter if they joined and then left or they joined and then came back, they're considered a third participant. So what happens is, as soon as that happens, you drop down to standard definition, 360p. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I was on a, <clears throat> on a Zoom meeting for a, um, uh, for a symposium called Stream Geeks that I had attended in person in New York a year earlier. And I'm sitting there with about 200 other people and I'm saying, wait a minute, <clears throat> why, why do we have high definition. And they said, well, that's because we don't have a pro account. We have a business account. Mm -hmm. And so I looked into business accounts and with a business account, you have to request high def and you also have to, in fact, I requested not only high def, but I had to make a case for 1080p. And it turns out that a, high, a business account uh, costs about uh, $240 a year, as opposed to the $150 a year that, um, that a regular pro account costs, except you need a minimum of 10 licenses. So I got together with Cindy Drozda and Lyle Jameson and um, uh, uh, Pat, um, oh God, uh, uh, Pat Carroll in, in uh, Ireland because there were those of us that were paying the $150 a year for a pro account and an extra $600 a year to get past the 100 person uh, uh, participant limit. So the pro account gives us 300, uh, 300 participants concurrent and I get high def. And I didn't make this as a general announcement to, to people. I let a bunch of people at, at, at Lucid know about it, but I couldn't open it up to like 500 people, 500 people doing this, because what we wound up doing was, I've got about 20 people and clubs or whatever that are part of this Zoom account. If this is something that is of interest to you, if you really want high definition, I, I would be happy to take on a, a few more uh, people into the account 
and it gets billed at three hundred dollars a year. Um, it's pretty much the 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 two forty that it cost me plus. Um, they determined that a 20% increase, the, the tipping the waiter that brought you the food um, yeah. is good. And, and so if you want to do that, just contact me and I'd be happy to set that up for you. It's also something that the a AAW could do uh, for clubs if they ever got behind a uh, hybrid meeting concept. Well, the big, the big problem is that, you know, come around November 27th when my uh, license is up for renewal, I have to shell out the 4000 or so yep. dollars in advance. If the AAW did that, that would be a, a, a big liability for them. Yep. Um, but and that's the reason why I didn't just open it up. But, you know, people in this group in particular are uh, are serious about, you know, their club meetings. Uh, the other thing is that if whatever money you paid into your existing Zoom account, uh, that gets prorated and returned to you. So if you're like you paid under fifty dollars, you're six months into it. When you join my account, they say, "Well, what do you want you to do with the rest of the money?" And it just goes back to you as a as a credit card. So it's just something. But that that's the reason you're getting crappy video is because it's the uh, in Zoom Zoom recordings, whether it be local or the cloud, is because you're down to three sixty p. I am Alan, guessing. I can't what, wait you know. to see Harvey's next page. Yeah, and yeah. Alan, uh, I'm going to ask people to get in touch with you to pursue that further. Yep, that's all. Okay. Okay. Yep. Harvey, go for it. All right. So um, the last um, point I made was that it's really desirable to have an offsite Zoom monitor that saved our bacon at the last meeting, and then. All that's left of this presentation is I did a simplified drawing of our sound setup because it was so counterintuitive for me and we had to screw around so much to get something that worked. So here it is. The green is the, the sound that goes into our room and the blue is the sound that comes out of Zoom. Um, I suspect there are 46 different ways to skin this cat and several people have talked about them uh, other ways tonight, but this is currently working for us. And that's, that's really all I have. Um, if people have more questions for me, I'd be happy to try and answer them now or later. That's a very good presentation, Harvey. Any more questions? Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see applause going on out there, which is also very nice. Yeah. Well, uh, you're, you're a good audience. Thanks. <laughs> it is a good audience. Yeah. And we're back to, I'm back to a gallery view so I can see everyone and I can see the hands up. Um, I, um, I have a short presentation, but I see some people in the room I'd like to hear from who, who there were some outstanding questions. And so if I, if I may, I'm going to do that. Um, Eric Brown, the last time you and I were in, in contact, you were talking about the difficulties you guys were having and you were thinking of, uh, just a second, I got to remove all the spotlights. You were thinking of giving up uh, hybrid meetings. Where, how, where did you guys come out on that? We're still discussing it. Um, we're still having problems. And I have, I have come to the conclusion that a lot of our problems is heat. Uh, we're meeting in the shop of one of our members, our founder, uh, and it is very hot in that shop and electronics don't like the heat. So um, uh, I've about come to the conclusion that the heat is most of our problem. Uh, our meetings start about 6.30. We get there about four to set up and get things working mostly, uh, sometimes not so good. And then we go get some supper and we come back and we come back and just half of it's not working again. So- um, And you think it's heat is the reason that happens? Yes, because it's it's upper 90s in that shop um, during our meeting time. And I, I think the, you know, like the hubs and maybe the cameras are overheating and shutting things down because I can go back the next day in the morning or, you know, when it's cooler and things work again. I think so. You, you might be right about that. How many are in your club? Um, I think we have over 100 paid, um, but... Right now we have about mm, 28 or so in person and probably 15 to 20 online. So a lot of your members are snowbirds. Yes, they are. So they yes, belong they to another club and they're up with their summer club now. 
Yes. Yeah. Do they so, attend, do they stay on with you guys in the in the in the off season when they're not in Florida, or do they just disappear? Um, now uh, that we are using hybrid Zoom meetings, they a lot of them do stay on, just and um, we're we're considering going to an in-person only and having our professional turners come on in-house as well. Um, and then the, the, our, our Northern people or whoever is zooming uh, would not see it. Now our end club demonstrations, we would record that and post it out to YouTube later so they could watch it but uh, we would not have a live Zoom meeting. And that's the, some of the, some of the board members want that, some of them don't. So it's still in discussions. Hmm. Any comments um, on that or questions for Eric? Yeah, I, I have one. Um, the problems that you've been having, um, what kind of things are they? What, what, are you, what are you seeing, not seeing, you know, when you come back from dinner? Well, we have a couple of microphones and we have three cameras and uh, we have everything working. Maybe, you know, when we go to get everything set up and working, they come back and maybe two of the cameras just all of a sudden don't work. Uh, we have to sometimes reboot those and they will, sometimes they'll work and then they'll work, they'll work for a while and then quit. Uh, sometimes one microphone will quit. We have a wireless mic and we have a, a wired mic. The wired one always works, picks up good. It just always works. But the, uh, the wireless will sometimes work, sometimes not. And then sometimes um, we just have Zoom just doesn't work, just didn't connect. Are you sure of the quality of your connection, your internet connection? It's a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, well, it could be part of the problem. It, it could be, but yeah. where, our, okay. where the router is, uh, I'd have to run a lengthy cable to, uh, to hook up wired. I mean, 90 degrees shouldn't shut your equipment down. I mean, I've done jobs where it was 100 degrees and uh, you know, outside in Arizona, and uh, things kept working. So um, you, you must have some other gremlins going on there. I mean, one of the things, quality of your cables, um, cables are amazingly working one minute and working and not working another. And, and the big thing is, is that all 19 of those conductors are connected inside those cables. A lot of cables you buy, there's anywhere from three to six uh, grounds that aren't connected inside those cables. And those cables will be very finicky. Um, so that's that's one spot your your microphones what microphones are you using let me pull up my document here uh microphones are Petron b-i-e-t-r-u-n uh w-x-m-07 uhf wireless lavalier mics and uh, the wired one is a toner handheld condenser mic. Yeah. Um, now they're marginal microphones, the wireless yeah. one. Um, and that's. I didn't buy them. They were already there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And that that could be your issue. We we've been using the wireless uh, in whole room uh, conference room speak mics, the puck mics, the CM one thousands. Uh, we've used several of them in the in the in the uh, meeting room that works pretty good daisy chain together for bringing sound in picking up to people in the room and taking it into the zoom call we do not have any uh mini atm i've been thinking about uh discussing getting one but we do not have one yet are your cameras hdmi cameras yes yeah because that's that's what you need with the hdmi mini uh, you know, it doesn't do anything with uh, webcams or phone or, or like that, or phoning in from from the smartphone. So sometimes I see people with uh, webcams buying an A10 Mini, and it's pointless. Yeah. They're Sony Handycams. Nice. Nine point two pixels. They're not. Those are nice cameras. 
Okay. Anything? Uh, questions for Eric? Are you guys? What do you? Uh, what's your opinion, Eric? Do you think you guys should go ahead with a uh, hybrid meetings, or are you going to pull back to just in room and videos? For now, we're going to as best we can. We're going to stay with the hybrids, and. Um, see what we can do i mean we got some people that are uh, the the guy that was the lead of the uh technology committee last year is now the club president and he's helping me out when he's done with his president duties and he's like um i'm about done with this <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he is he is in favor of doing away with zoom and a couple of other board members are, but uh, there's other board members that are like, no, we've got people that are tied into this and, you know, we gave it to them. We don't want to take it away from them. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it too. And we got uh, RDI people scheduled out months in advance. Um, they don't want to, you know, tell them, sorry, we're going to, you know, you got to come in house. Yeah. Hey, any other questions for Eric? Now, I don't know how many of those that are scheduled remote would actually uh, want to come in house now. You know, if they're, they got their, uh, I, I'm noticing a lot of them are showing videos and a lot of people are no longer doing live turnings. They're doing slide shows or videos as part of their demonstration. And, uh, you know, sitting comfortable in their house. I don't know how many of those people would like to get out and travel again. Well, I'm going to take the spotlight off you and put it on Belcher, uh, who is a demonstrator, because we, he and I have talked about this a lot. And I wonder if he'd address us for a bit on the issues of uh, face the demonstrator. I, 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 as I was mentioning earlier, I, I had COVID in January. And, you know, here I am six months later, and my energy levels are still not back to the way that they were. And, you know, it, it gives me great pause to think about returning to the patterns of pre-COVID, uh, which is, you know, staying with a host family, which a lot of ways was really enjoyable. But I'm not so sure that I want to bring um, my, my contagions into their home. And I'm not so sure that I want to bring their contagions back into my home. So it, it really gives me pause. I don't, uh, I, I really haven't resolved that in my own, my own mind, but it's, it is a concern because our world has changed and we're all struggling to find the, the right balance point in it. Um, and I don't know where that goes, folks. I don't think any of us are that smart. So. Well, Dennis, you, what you and I have talked about a lot is the issues that the demonstrator faces connecting with the people in the room. And that's something that a lot of clubs are not totally tuned into. And I thought maybe you, you would talk to that. Yeah, I, I would like to address that. I, you know, it, it is bothersome to me to hear this conversation about demonstrators using recorded videos. I mean, there's a place for it. But the, 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 at the end of the day, this is a person talking to a person. And as soon as you can it, all of a sudden, it's just not the same as a live performance. So, but to have it be a live performance, that the, the, the speaker needs feedback from the audience. You know, not only do you need to be able to see the audience, but you need to be able to see faces in the audience. Um, I recently demonstrated to the Enchanted Woodturners, best experiences the demonstrator I've had uh, as people have gone back to hybrid meetings. And what they had simply done is taken a camcorder and pointed it directly at the audience and zoomed it in enough is that I could see the entire room. They used the microphone on that camcorder to give me feedback from the room. So when I cracked the joke, I could hear the laughter and I could see the last guy in the room who was going to sleep and I could pick at him, all right? Uh, you know, you cut that off, you, you know, you, we, we, we've all focused on so much and delivering an experience to the audience, but to really get that live, you gotta, you gotta give feedback to the demonstrator. I'm done. Well, I guess that's the question. How do, what do you guys in the club think? How can we do that? The silence is 
It's very important because Don? time and time and time clubs haven't thought about it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the simplest ways to do it without complication is to have another laptop in the room um, that is that is dedicated to looking at the audience. It's I just another uh, participant. Can't... Well, yeah, yeah, that actually, Rick, that's a good idea. I mean, make it a, it a participant in the Zoom room. Yeah. Uh, so now I can see all that group as one block. I do that right. with but, an iPad. An iPad. But the key is you well. can't use you you can't use the, the 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 camera on the laptop. It's not high enough quality. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you have to have another. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an iPad yeah. does better, uh, and you can also do yeah. You you got to get into the call so you have your own Zoom window as well. Otherwise, you're switching cameras and that window is replacing another window rather than appearing alongside it. Like I'm spotlighting two Zoom windows <clears throat> to bring these two guys into the screen. It, it's also important that if you do have two Zoom participants in a meeting, that only one of them in the same room, only one of them has audio on. Otherwise, you're going to get horrible feedback. Yeah, yeah, we've all experienced that. That's for sure. Um, anybody else? So, hey, John, Steve. John, this is Steve. Uh, I, 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 I'm the president of the Raleigh Club um, in North Carolina, and um, so when COVID started, we we went to two meetings. We have one meeting, which is the demonstration meeting. We have a second meeting, which is the show and tell meeting. And um, we had our first hybrid meeting last week, which separate discussion. But but what we have decided to do is that. Um, if we are doing an IRD, we're going to keep it a, a full Zoom meeting uh, without live people there, and then we're going to have a live show and tell meeting. If we have a demonstrator, live demonstrator in, in the room, we're going to have that meeting will be, so we meet on the second Thursday and the third Thursday of the month. So, so we'll have one live meeting every month, and it'll either be a show and tell meeting or a, an I, or a demonstration. And again, if it's the, if it's the, um, if it's an IRD, we're just going to stay on Zoom because we, that's what our members want. And so, you know, the, the demonstrator can still get audience reactions by looking at a gallery view um, in there. But but that's we asked our members and that's, you know, they're very comfortable to watch an IRD from there. They don't want to travel to watch an IRD in a room. Just look at a video on a screen. So um, so that's that's how we're addressing that issue. Um, but we will have one live, one hybrid meeting every month, um, whether it, either the show and tell or the um, or the demonstration. How big is your club, Steve? Uh, we have 110 members. And how many typically come to an in-person meeting and how many typically come on a Zoom? Well, before COVID, we would get 50 or 60 in person. Um, on our Zoom meetings now, we're typically getting about 50 for our demonstration meeting and you know, 35 to 40 for our um, um, our show and tell meetings. What we found is that, and I, I bet I know other clubs are the same thing, is that that a lot of our members now are not local. I mean, we have members and we have people tuning in from California and Oregon and Maine. And <laughs> so, you know, it's a, there, there's a need to stay hybrid, but um, no, I can appreciate the fact of the lack of feedback by a demonstrator, and again, that that's how that's how we're addressing it. We're just going to we're go we're going full Zoom um, on when we're doing an IRD. We do the same thing. IRD is is, is Zoom only, and then we have a uh, a local Turner does uh, in our hybrid meeting. Now, who's that? I, I want to spotlight you. Who's who's talking? Oh, Eric again. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. I, I didn't mean. I'm sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> well, that was about it. So, you know, just two meetings. We have two meetings, and our, you know, our professional IRD is is Zoom only. Um, so we don't have to go out and set up something for somebody to sit and watch. Uh, and then our local meeting uh, is uh, hybrid and uh, recorded. How about how many other clubs do that with two meetings and uh, split split the problem up that way? Okay, looks like nobody else. Okay, Dennis, are you done or you got more to say there? No, go right ahead. We got a lot of other hands and we're running out of time. Okay, I'm gonna just get these other spotlights out of here. Uh, I gotta remove certain 
Ooh, all spotlights. Barbara LaPresse, what do you want to say? Hi, sorry I was late. I had my other meeting that I have on the third Monday of the month every month. Um, you talked about, as I came into it, the, the hybrid versus the in-person. We have chosen that when we have a demonstrator that is going to do an IRD a type of a meeting, we're going to do it at our homes. There's no sense in pulling everybody in to a room and let them sit there and watch it. They can sit, they can have their glass of wine, their glass of beer, whatever they want in their home. Do we lose some people? Yes, because we have a few people who still don't do Zoom. But we're doing up to four meetings a month. We have one that's entirely in person. We have some that are, all the rest of them are usually hybrid. We moved to hybrid in August of last year, right away. And yes, we have had a few that are dedicated only. I mean, our speaker was in Georgia and I'm in Syracuse, New York. So he did the presentation from there and it was a PowerPoint, but it was because of the type of demonstration. He was teaching the members how to use Inkscape and GIMP. So it was really a computerized class anyway. Um, so wait, we did just us, have- Tell us about your club a little bit. You're a very unusual club, I think. Yes, we are. We have 257 members as of today. Uh, we have gotten 77 new members this year. Um, don't ask me where they're coming from because they're just appearing. And um, we have four groups. So we have a mass, the major club, and then we have four special interest groups underneath. So we have the woodworkers that cover all the different areas. We have the turners, we have the scrollers, and we have the carvers. So the carvers are exclusively in person. The scrollers um, are usually in, uh, in person and they're usually hybrid. We try and do those hybrid and we get maybe 20 people at them, but that's typical for that, that small group. The turners we get we can go up to 50, 60 people between the combined in-person and the Zoom people because we still are getting a large population on Zoom. We have one member whose doctor has told him to stay low, do not, do not interact with people yet. Um, he had some eye issues during co early on on COVID. And so his doctor has said, please try and lay low still. And he, he was on Zoom for our Rebecca DeGroot event over the weekend. So we had Rebecca DeGroot here in person for a Saturday demonstration all day. And um, we Zoomed it out for him and one other member. And then another member in the afternoon had to go home and he ran it Zoom also. And we had all of our five, four cameras set up in the room running through our system. Uh, and we've recorded it in vmix and in two two separate areas and we'll have that available to those that attended so but the board made a decision that if we can do in person we're doing in person but if there's some reason and and we'll we'll combine it with a hybrid with the zoom option at all times if at all possible but if not they'll sit at home and most of our people are very happy to sit at home if it's a, if it's something that is not demonstrated out of our main facility now you have a permanent meeting space, do you not? Um, no, we meet at a, at a, we, three of our groups meet at the firehouse in a community room in the firehouse. All our equipment is contained in a box um, that's a, basically a roadie box. Um, and we, in fact, even Rebecca looked at it and went, oh my God, how did that all fit in there on sat Saturday when we packed it all up? And we bring that box home every time. We do not leave it there. Um, the, what about displays? What do you have for displays, big TVs? We have a projection system built into that room. The fire department put one in, uh, the commissioners put one in several years ago. We were willing to pay for it many years ago um, and they paid for it on their own to put in a projector with a full 96 inch uh, or screen that pulls down so we project onto that through their projection system we hook right in our microphones hook right into their microphone system we have our own miking system in our whole setup 
So you can get in there and set up pretty fast then. You don't have a two hour setup routine. We have gotten it down to where we can do it in probably 45 minutes or less um, if we if we have help. Um, the big thing is finding out how the where the demonstrator needs to have the cameras. Um, we spent a good hour or so setting up for Rebecca on Friday night, mainly because we didn't want to set up on Saturday morning early. And it gave us an opportunity to play. We um, it's the second time we've had an Ozbot, Obsbot camera in place in use. Uh, we got our own and used it uh, earlier in July. I have to remember my brain is frazzled on dates. Now, so the, the Obsbot is the camera that'll follow you around. Yep. Yeah. How's it work? Works very nice, very nice. And I have the extra controls that I that we added into the system for Saturday. So I was able to move it myself, um, which was great. You mean remotely? Um, I could sit there at the at the camera system. I didn't use the remote. We haven't we haven't synced the remote with it, but I could sit there at the camera system and move it myself because I was I was doing the switching of cameras. I was doing all of the work on the camera system and How do you changing things. How do you move it yourself? Is it an on-screen control joystick? It's a it's a it's a control panel that you just bring up and you hit the button and go over to the right or go to the left and you can set it and go different places. Is any, so, I know that Alan Zenreich has been using these. Has anybody else been using these Osbot things? They're Dennis great. has one. Yeah, it, it really it it stops the problem of walking off camera. Yes. Uh, and you got to get used to the hand controls, but uh, I, I would very much encourage the use of the Osbot in appropriate situations, but it's USB. It's not HDMI. Yes, it is USB, but all of our cameras are USB and we have a USB three uh, connection on our computer that we hook it directly into and we yeah. bought a specific cable to connect it to, to get the higher speed with it. So. We thought ahead and, and we're, we're, we bought the upgraded version. We didn't buy the old version because we know we're going to go up higher and we don't want to sit back. We bought all of our camera system and set our camera system up in 2019 before COVID hit. We had all of our system built. So we had time to practice with it. Um, we ran all of our Zoom sessions from, our, from a, a remote location, actually my house in a garage, in our workshop space during the entire COVID, and we were able to use everything. So I want to go back to the, this Osbot for a minute. I mean, the, the key for me in the Osbot is I'm doing this all myself. So anytime I don't have to think about where the camera is, that's a win. Normally yes. in a club situation, there's a dedicated cameraman or a production engineer like you are. And in those situations, you're, you're substituting uh, 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 a real head instead of artificial intelligence. So I'm not so sure that in, in most club environments that the Osbot really is, is adding thing better than which, well, a, a human cameraman who's awake is better than an Osbot. Say it that way. Well, how about I, a human person working the uh, screen control that Barbara described? Is that as good as a human cameraman on the camera? In other words, remote control of the camera. From the op from the operator desk, can that work? Does that work? Yeah, it perhaps. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, yes. Again, it, it comes back to how good <laughs> how good the, the what, what's Alan saying? Yes, I yeah, agree it, with Alan. It, it, the answer is is absolutely yes. And for those people that are using things like an A10 Mini or a Feel World, uh, as that requires HDMI inputs. Um, Obsbot is now selling their branded version of the RGB link. UVC to HDMI adapter, which will take any oh. webcam signal and convert it to HDMI. Well, that's What's the cost of it, Alan? You know the cost? The cost is $169. From okay. Obspot, yeah. Or, or from RGB Link, yeah. Now, will yeah. it take more than one camera? Is it a one camera thing? No, it, it will take one camera. I can actually show it to you. I've got it sitting right here. Um, the, the, it takes one camera. It's got it, an input for on one side, it's got an input for power, which you have to power it through a PD uh, source, not a regular five volt source. Uh, so uh, uh, USB-C PD is, is fine. It's got a port that you plug the camera into, but it's also got a, a, another uh, HDMI, not an HDMI, another uh, USB port 
Like, let me just put it on, on screen here. I'll take this one out here. Um, this is the towel version of it. And, and you see it's got a USB port that will accept the OBSPOT remote control. So I can actually sit here um, if I, you know, oh, I, I unplugged it. Um, uh, I can actually sit here with the OBSPOT remote or the OBSPOT app that uh, Barbara was talking about and move it around. Picture a camera on the audience side of the lathe pointing towards the demonstrator. And then if you wanted to swing it around to point to the audience, it's a fairly slow swing. It takes about nine seconds to do 180 degrees, but um, it, it works. And the oh. OBSPOT itself is less than $200 these days. Well, the OBSPOT Mini is two, 275 So the OBSPOT Mini plus 160 you you're, you're heading for $500 here. Now, you're, but compare that to a PTZ camera. Which costs what? Up, upwards of $1,000. OK. Is anybody oh, else using this gear? Because I've been it's very what? interested in it. Is anybody else using that equipment that, he's, that you guys are talking about? We're not using all that. We're using the OBSPOT, and it works real well like for a demonstrator when you have somebody to, to do the camera. If you were by yourself, I could see it being a problem because <coughs> you can't get the up and down tilt of the camera by yourself easily without the remote. And we didn't get the remote because at the time we bought the camera, the remote had a problem. And uh, Alan recommended against getting the remote at that time. But since then, they fixed that. Um, so it's very effective. Uh, it falls real well. But it has a centering. You can have more overhead space or less overhead space. Uh, some choices you have that to make. Uh, but it's it has made a real difference in camera work with something on the demonstrator. Because you know how people pick their hands up and they pick something up. If you can teach them to hold it here, you always have the picture. If they're going to hold it on their belly, then you got to get another camera. What's nice is that. We have demonstrators who wander. So I've got a guy who's going to talk in October, and I'm not even sure what he's going to talk about, but he'll wander when he talks. And he's the former Stickley, his Stickley furniture historian. And who knows what he's going to talk about this year. So he'll wander, but it'll follow him, and we won't have to worry as much. But for turning, we used it mostly on Rebecca yesterday or Saturday. And we had the other more stationary cameras that we switched in and out and we I zoomed as needed. Now, one of the cameras that I think that a lot of people have missed out on using, and we started using this four or five months ago, is that we put a camera on the front side of the lathe low. So it picks up the front side of your image of when, when you're turning so that it you can, people can see that image on the front and see what's going on and, and they can they can oftentimes judge what's going on. And Rebecca really liked that image when we had that up on the screen. Because of course she has a confidence monitor that we put there for her. And she so she could see all the different images and she worked with me as needed. I usually was ahead of her in figuring out what image she wanted, but that that's, that camera down low in the very front of the lathe to give that upward look or front look on what's there has really made a difference in some of our demonstrations for turning. Now, are you shifting cameras, switching cameras through Zoom then? No, we're switching them through through vMix. Oh, I see. We so have a whole, we have a desktop unit in this, in this bot, in this box that we have. And I, I'll, I took some pictures Saturday and I need to put something together for you. Um, but we have a whole computer in there with everything in there with vMix in it and everything else. And so we're using vMix to control everything. We, we bring in images, we bring in video. Um, you know, Rebecca was talking about her aquifer I, uh, pieces, which she was not demonstrating. And I went out and found a picture of one and brought it in so the rest of the audience could see it and put it up there for her. Um, you know, she was talking about something else she's doing in collaboration with someone and I brought in that as well. 
right off the internet because I have an internet hookup in there, a, a wireless hit internet hookup, by the way. We're not wired hookup in that room. We were wired when we were in my garage all during COVID. So how hard was it to learn vMix and how many people in your club are adept with it? There's probably five, six of us that are adept with it at this point in time. I use it only occasionally. Um, I've become sort of one of the default operators as well as everything else, um, mostly because our guys are just tired. Um, but we have a couple other people who are who are trained. Do we need more? Yes. And that's one of the things we're struggling with. With 257 members, we need to get more involved. I actually sent out a, ask, an ask for help today for some work we have to do Friday at the New York State Fair. And I'm getting people I didn't even know existed in our club to come to help. So we're starting to get people involved in, and getting them to help. We just have to ask for help. Uh, Barbara, Barbara, just one thing uh, to mention for those of you that are using either the uh, monthly version, the vMix Max, or have one of the upper levels, the 4K or the Pro version, um, you can control the OBSPOT because it uses UVC PTZ. You can control that um, through a uh, uh, through a uh, an Xbox controller. Um, so whoop, I've just got to come over here. I'm, I'm sure so, you have no idea how bewildered you leave us with these sorts of things, Alan. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm just giving, I'm just trying to give people options. No, to, I, understand, I, I understand that. But what I want to, the point I want to make is that uh, I, my experience is that adding in vMix and things like that may work for those who are adept with it, but it becomes formidable for the club leader coming to this cold. I, I absolutely understand. And the, the analogy that I like to make is that it's, you don't introduce somebody to wood turning by putting them in front of someone that's do, doing open segmented work. Right. And that's the, the like question that. is, right. The question is, if you have it, I was talking to somebody this morning who's using the, the monthly version of vMix and he's using OBSBOTS and he didn't know that you could control it from within vMix. That's my point. A $30 controller there will let you do it and set up as many and as many uh, uh, virtual inputs as you want. So just trying to let people know that the stuff exists. I'm not advocating that they use it, but if they don't know that it's there, then there's then there's no point. I think the key is that vMix gave us a, a step up, and and we were very lucky because we put together our system in 2019. <clears throat> before everything hit. We had some experience with it. When COVID hit, we figured out what to do and we took maybe a, two months off from, from events just to get things organized, if even that, because I think we actually started up again in May. And we then produced every month at least three demonstrations in person or via Zoom in Zoom, we had a production crew. You had hair and makeup. You had the director. The hair and makeup always had a challenge. You had people who were not allowed to touch equipment because they unplugged cables when they shouldn't have. Um, but you had people that set things up. We also had the advantage because of where we were located in our garage, in our workshop. My husband and I happened to have a second set of tools out there from our main workshop in the house. So we were able to do all the safety tools, safety classes on how to use a table saw effectively. What are the safety issues? The issues with bandsaws, how to tune a bandsaw, how to use it properly, miter saw, joiner, planer, all those things that you usually don't have the ability to work to do because you can't bring the equipment to you. So- Hey, hey John, can I ask John a question? Go for it. John, John how much is left on the agenda? No, this is fine. I'm interested to hear these conversations develop. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to go to any other agenda. Can wait for next meeting. So, Barbara. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. You, said, you leave your setups there. It's all set up in a box. How do you accommodate updates on your vMix and your computers? Um, I routinely will turn it on and do the updates um, on the uh, Windows. I'll sit there and do the updates. VMix, you don't have to, you are not required to update VMix all the time. Um, and Alan will tell you that. We've, we're still deciding whether, if we're going to 
buy the extra updates because you actually have to buy them. Um, so we're fine with what we have, but the Windows updates, I will periodically um, open it up or after a, before a meeting starts, I'll get there early enough and get it set up and I'll sit and run through the updates. Um, but I so have been a, known to open it up and do it myself. I'm, you're on I used to do that. VMix. You're on Pardon? an older license of VMix. Alan suggested to me that we buy the new one and keep the old license too. So we've that, got two licenses. And yeah, that's only if you that. that's only if you're dealing with the sixty dollar license. Oh, okay. VMix is Z, VMix has only up charged for updates twice in the last seven years. Yeah, and and and, and, yeah. and it's yeah. only sixty dollars. So we we haven't done that update. If I have to, I can open it up and set up just what I need. I think the that update. I think the updates that Gerald's asking about is when the, P the IBM PC goes into update mode when you want to start a meeting. You got to get that out of the way before you go. No, no. no I hit that. I hit that quick. I, I I'm experienced. I used to deal with PCs. I'm I'm well aware of that stuff. And, and in fact, my husband's on another laptop over there right now, and his laptop's doing its updates right now. Um, but that stuff, I'm I know that's the second Tuesday of every month. Um, having that was my job when I was working was to run those updates so I know the schedule um, which happens to hit when our meetings are sure. so I sure. usually am interrupting it for that so in other words John, John, here's the, another thing when you open vmix it locks out the Microsoft the updates. updates they will not right. run while vmix is running yeah yeah yeah, yeah. in fact right. our our system when I went to shut it down Saturday it needed to do updates and I said no because I'll deal with that in the next two weeks. Our next mm -hmm. meeting's not till August 3rd that I need the computer for. Well, I'm gonna so, uh, spike you all or move all the spotlights because it's coming up to 8.30 here and we are resolved to hold this to 90 minutes. And this has been a very fascinating hour or hour and a half uh, and we will be posting the recording of this. Um, I will be personally continuing to make my uh, beginner series of tutorials to introduce all of the aspects of Zoom that I'm familiar with in hybrid meetings to uh, other clubs to make that stuff accessible and posting those to the AAW Leadership Board. I want to encourage other people to make videos of your stuff of what do you think works. Um, I come into a discussion like this and people start talking about vMix and they start talking about Ozbots and frankly it makes my head spin. Uh, but it would make my head spin a lot less if, if the people who are really good at that stuff would uh, take the trouble to make a little 10 minute video maybe and uh, and show it off and explain it so that we can understand it and uh, help us get up to it. And we will help you with that if you have any trouble and we will post them where other people can get at them. So that's my uh, my request to you. Uh, if, if you have this kind of specialized, <laughs> I'm gonna contact a bunch of the people who've been on here tonight and arrange uh, for future presentations with them as well. Um, there's some people here I wanted to hear from more tonight that we won't hear from today, but we'll get them next time. I know that the uh, Golden Horseshoe Group is thundering towards a major decision on what to install and there's been quite a bit of uh, back and forth with them that i'd like to hear about and the same with the ottawa group and uh like that there's a lot going on here so we will be back in august on the third monday which uh, if my computer will tell me here it is august the 15th um we'll be on again with this with this forum uh, any of you would like to make presentations, please get in touch with me to talk about it. I will encourage you to try and uh, prepare and rehearse your presentation and hold it to 15 minutes, unless you're as interesting as Harvey Rogers was. Uh, everyone, uh, because Harvey, your setup is a lot like what a lot of clubs have, and a lot of clubs are wrestling with the problems you're wrestling with. And that makes it very possible for us to learn from you. And that's what this is all about, is learning from each other. Can we get oh. Harvey's presentation? Um, we will be putting the video out tomorrow. It'll all be on there. And if he's going to, and I have his as a PowerPoint, I can, if, if that's okay with Harvey, I'll send it out along with the email. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have the PowerPoint and you'll also have the video. Um, anybody else with any last words? And if not, I'll thank you all for a very interesting forum as usual. And we'll see you all in August. Good night, all. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Good night. I know.